Hi everybody, Professor Gassimi here. We're now at the tutorial component of the lecture. And um, here we're gonna be going over the fourth assignment in the course. This should all be familiar to you in terms of the layout of these assignments, so I won't spend much time on that. I do wanna say at a high level though, this assignment has five parts, and um, each of those parts pertains to a particular goal of the assignment. So the, the first part we'll be discussing uh, practically how you use word to vec for embedding your text. The second one is a, um, a document level generalization of word to vec called doc to vec. In the third component of this tutorial, we're gonna be speaking a little bit about something called batching. Now. Batching doesn't really have anything to do with um, neural networks or um, you know, the theoretical components of machine learning. It has to do with practically if you want to train a model using very large data sets when you have you know, a non-infinite amount of memory, how do you go about doing that? So we're going to be covering some of the practical techniques people use, and one of those is batching. In the fourth component of the tutorial, we'll be discussing recurrent neural networks which we discussed in the lectures. And in the fifth, we're gonna be discussing parts of speech tagging, or rather tools that exist to help you with parts of speech tagging. Okay, so let's start with word to vec Now the data that we're gonna be using for this week's hands-on discussion of word to vec is the same as what we've used previously. It's the Rotten Tomatoes data set again. And we're gonna break it into sentences and class labels and tokenize the text using the NLTK tokenizer. So remember, this is from the Hugging Face uh, load data set library. So I'm gonna load the Rotten Tomatoes data set here. And I'm just sort of pasting together their training, validation, and testing data sets here for the sentences as well as uh, for the outcome label that I care about. And then I've got a very simple for loop here that is taking each of the sentences in the training data set, converting it to lowercase, um, taking care of anything funny that might be happening um, with the, the encoding by casting it to Unicode, and then finally tokenizing it using NLTK's tokenizer. Okay, so that's all this text block does. Now this process is obviously gonna convert the data into a list of lists with the first level of the list corresponding to the review and the second level corresponding to a word. So here's an example. If I just print out the first element there, you can see that I have a, uh, a lovely tokenized list of words here. Okay, so in the lecture last week, we had introduced word to vec right? But you didn't get to play with it in the homework. Um, the homework was already a little bit too long and I didn't want to sort of burden you all with that. So let's play with word to vec a little bit more in this tutorial. Okay, specifically, let's compute a word level embedding for the Rotten Tomatoes data set. And we're gonna use the GenSim word to vec implementation to do this. So the way you can, you can do that is you import GenSim. And specifically from GenSim, you're gonna import this word to vec uh, module. And once you've done this, uh, using GenSim is just as simple as sort of passing in those sentences, the list of lists that we discussed earlier, and choosing some of the settings of the hyperparameters, right? And once you run this, your word to vec model is trained and it's saved in model, okay? It's very, very simple, very straightforward, okay? Note that there are several hyperparameters here. You can read through um, these hyperparameters on your own time and you'll see that a lot of them sort of fall into line with the things that we either discussed in the course or what Mikhailov discussed in his original paper on the topic. So for instance, this SG flag is whether you're gonna use the continuous bag of words implementation or you're gonna use the skip gram implementation. You may recall that in the lectures, we, we spoke about this CBOW implementation um, and this feature, for example, the size says, how large do you want the embedding to be? In our case, we're gonna choose it to be uh, two so that we get a two-dimensional embedding. This window size says, 
what's the context window that you want to use? You want to use two word neighbors? Do you want to use three words neighbors? Or you know, how far out do you want to use the context when you're coming up with the embedding for a given word? Okay, so and there's obviously other features here as well. Okay, well, this GenSim object, the model object, actually has many tools kind of built into it. But I actually think instead of learning how to master GenSim, it's just better to learn how to look at the actual matrices um, that represent the words. So we can cast the uh, word vectors that are contained or learned by the GenSim into a set of vectors here by just kind of indexing our way through their object and casting it to a NumPy array. And we can also extract the unique vocabulary that comes from our training data. Okay, And what you'll notice here is that um, the dimensionality of the word vector matrix is 10,162 by 2. This 2 is because we asked for a two-dimensional representation, right? So there's two columns in it. And this 10162 says, hey, for each of the words in our vocabulary, which you may recall was uh, 10,000 from uh, the previous uh, assignment, we want to generate a two-dimensional representation. So that's why it's 10,000 roughly by 2. Okay, so let's start off by plotting some of these word vector representations. And one of the ways we can do that is let's specify a set of words here um, that we might like to see the vectors for, and then let's just plot them using matplotlib. Okay, if I plot them here, you see that for each of the words that I specified up here, I have a corresponding point that shows up on this plot. So good has a point, bad, great, hero, dog, king, and queen. Now it seems at first glance, if you just kind of look at this plot, that the two-dimensional word embedding from word to vec provides something sensible, right? The words that might describe a movie's ranking, good, bad, and great, for example, are closer to each other than the words that might describe a potential protagonist, for example, dog, hero, queen, or king, which are kind of clustered down here. Okay, now we can assess this formally by using the cosine similarity, which we discussed in the previous lecture. And I've written the equation for that once again down here. So it's the dot product between the vectors um, divided by the norms of each of those vectors multiplied. Okay, now please note that this cosine similarity is generally used as a metric for measuring distance when the magnitude of the vectors does not matter. This happens when you're working with text data because word counts end up kind of mangling exactly where these uh, these points get placed in the space, and that's the reason that you use a cosine similarity. Okay, if you find a way of representing your text where the word counts don't matter, then you can use Euclidean distance instead of cosine similarity. Okay, I've defined the cosine similarity by just implementing this equation up here, and I'm going to use it to compute the cosine similarity between some of the words that were in that uh, plot. So, for example, good and bad. Let me zoom in a little so that you can see this. There we go. So we have here between good and bad. We have here between uh, king and bad and then king and queen. And you can see as I print the cosine similarity, good and bad uh, are more similar. And these are because they're used to describe the qualities of the movie, right? They show up in similar contexts, which is describing something about how good the movie was or how bad the movie was for that matter. Uh, king and bad, which describes, for example, protagonist kind of things and the rating of the movie are placed further apart, but then king and queen are again closer. I chose this example very um, intentionally because I wanted to note that word to vec is really not magical, right? I mean, e even though you and I know good and bad mean very different things, from word to vecs perspective, as long as they showed up in similar contexts in this particular data set, then they are similar, okay? And I I chose this example because I wanted to highlight um, that to you. Okay, another thing that's really important to keep in mind if you're going to be using uh, word to vec to generate uh, representations of the tokens in your text is that um, it doesn't have any you know, special intuition about the words, right? It's just seeking a way to represent them as a function of context, okay? And so 
it's going to be sensitive to not only the training data, as we already discussed, but also the settings of the hyperparameters. Remember how above, let me scroll up here and show you again. Remember how up here we set these hyperparameters? I said, oh, I'm going to choose an, uh, an embedding size of two. I'm going to choose my context window to be two. I'm going to use the, um, con you know, the continuous bag, of, I'm sorry, the skip gram model instead of the continuous bag of words model and so on and so forth. Well, depending on how I change these, I'm going to get slight variations to my embeddings. So for example, let's come back down here now um, to where we were. And let's just change. We're going to keep everything the same. Okay, so this is the same set of keywords. This is the same uh, plot that I was interested in. I'm just going to create a second model called model two by training a, another word to VEC. And this model two, I'm going to just change from using the skip gram to using the continuous bag of words or SIBO. Okay, that's all I'm going to change in the hyperparameters. And then I'm going to plot the word vectors for both. Now, you can see I've made um, the red points if they came from the skip gram embedding and the blue points if they came from the SIBO embedding. Okay, now notice that the precise embeddings for the words have changed, but the relative distances between many of the words are preserved. So that is to say that, okay, good, bad, and great are all still clustered here together, and they're relatively further away from hero, king, queen, and dog in blue over here. But when I look at, for example, the things that came um, from uh, the other setting of the hyperparameters, the, the red points, which correspond to skip gram embeddings, you can see that good, bad, and great are now down here, but they're still relatively further away from, from these points, okay? So the reality of these word embeddings that, you know, they don't consistently show up in the same place, depending on the hyperparameters, can make it challenging to perform one-to-one -one comparisons between word embeddings generated by two models. For example, these two models that we showed um, some of the samples from right now. Okay, now obviously one of the factors that's going to impact the utility of your word vectors is the size of the embedding dimension. A 10-dimensional representation, for example, is going to be better equipped to represent heterogeneity in the movie review data than a two-dimensional representation will. I mean, intuitively think about it like this. Assume you want to describe the way that um, someone's face looks. Well, if you can only use two features to describe their face, what their nose looks like and their one of their eyes looks like, you're obviously going to be less able to represent all the heterogeneities of all the faces that you know if you only have those two dimensions that you can express. If I gave you 10, you might do better. If I gave you 1,000, you might do even better than that, and so on and so forth. So higher dimensional representations can represent more heterogeneous data sets. And so for that reason, it's common practice to generate embeddings that are larger, but then when you want to visualize them, you cast them into smaller domains, okay? So let's go ahead and train word to vec here once again, but notice that I'm going to increase the size of um, the embedding the vector to 100 now. Okay, so it's going to be 100 dimensions for each of the words in my vocabulary. Okay, I'm going to extract them just like I did before. And of course, there's not an intuitive way to visualize a 100 dimensional vector. And we need a way to reduce the dimensionality so that we can visualize it well. One of the ways we can do that is PCA. That's what we discussed previously, right? So let's import PCA just as we did before. Let's go ahead and um, use PCA to come up with the two-dimensional representation of this, which is, comes from the first two principal components. And let's again plot those points that we looked at earlier. Now, I, I want you to notice that this embedding is similar albeit not identical, but it's similar to what we obtained when we set the size of the embedding to two directly. So that bodes well, right? That you can sort of, you can manage um, working with analytically larger representations and then kind of moving them into a smaller dimensional domain when you want to do visualizations. Now, PCA is great, but there are other techniques um, that are not um, as rigid as PCA. And when I say rigid, I mean they don't make assumptions about, for example, orthogonal basis vectors. And so they provide a more flexible way to embed your data within a 2D space. One of those techniques is called st uh, st 
distributed stochastic neighbor embedding, or TSNE for short. And TSNE basically helps you with this embedding without the linear restrictions that come with PCA. If you're interested in learning more about TSNE, you can actually visit the website of the person who created it. I've provided a hyperlink here, and he has his very well-documented code available on his website. You can copy-paste it directly into Python, tweak the parameters, try to get an intuition for how the algorithm works by looking through his software. It's, it's quite well-commented, so I'd recommend it. Okay, at the end of the day, though, note that just like word devec TSNE has several hyperparameters that are going to impact how it generates the lower dimensional representations, okay? You can find a full list of the hyperparameters for the sklearn implementation, which I'm going to be showing here in a minute online, along with some advice on how to select them, okay? So let's, without further ado, see it. This code block just implements the TSNE embedding. Specifically, these lines are what implement the TSNE embedding, and the rest of the stuff here is for plotting purposes. Okay, and what I've shown here is a comparison of if I do it for all the words in the Rotten Tomatoes data set um, using PCA versus TSNE, you can see that the embeddings look very, very different when projected into two dimensions. I actually would uh, argue that what TSNE came up with is probably a little better looking than this. I don't know without probing these points if the particular two-dimensional representation that TSNE came up with is actually better than PCA's representation. And actually that's one of the problems in working with Python, right? Is that it's, you know, it's not interactive. You'd have to go about generating a new plot. You'd have to uh, do a lot of work if you wanted to interact with these uh, data in a, an easy way. Well, if you're gonna be looking at embeddings, there's actually some tools online that will help you do these interactions. One of those is, is a, uh, a tool um, that was generated by TensorFlow, um, and it's, it's, it's called the projector. And I've, I've opened the projector here in this uh, tab of my web browser. And what I'd like to do is I'd like to show you how we can load um, some of the, the data that I just uh, I just generated using here in, in, in Jupyter Lab. Okay, so I'm going to save basically my data in a, the proper format down here. Okay, that's what this code block does. You can sort of copy paste this and use it for your own work if you'd like. Um, this basically just saves these two files here called uh, Rotten Tomatoes Metadata.tsv and Rotten Tomatoes Tensors.tsv, and it just puts them, this code block just puts this in the right format. Okay, so once I have that data written to the files, I can come back to this uh, TensorFlow projector and I can load that data here. So I'm gonna choose the files here real quick. So this first one was the tensors. Okay, yes. And then the second one was the metadata, which says um, the names of each of those points. So I've done that, now I can click outside to dismiss, and, and you can see now, this is showing me PCA not in two dimensions, but in three dimensions, right? And you can see obviously in three dimensions, it looks very different than it did in, in two dimensions. And more specifically, there's two clusters that emerged here, right? And I can kind of hover my cursor over this, and I can see what each of the clusters mean. I can also kind of turn the space around, I can zoom in, I can zoom out. And there's all sorts of other sort of fun things you can do with this projector, including one of the things I like is looking for terms like, for example, let's look for the word cat and it will give you all the words that have uh, the, the word or this a match for this string cat within it, including obviously the word cat itself. Um, and you can sort of see who cat's nearest neighbors are and, and things like that in this space, right? Okay, well, this not only allows us to, to see the PCA representation in three dimensions, but it also allows us, if you look down here, to do the TSNE, for example, representation of this space. So I just click TSNE. It's going to spend a little bit of time um, computing given these hyperparameter settings that were, that were specified on the panel. And you'll see it here in one moment. So what you can see is that uh, TSNE uh, 
it trains in iteration. So it's not like PCA in the sense that there's a single unique, you know, uh, optimal setting of those basis vectors um, for a given data set. This thing is, is going to iteratively try to find a way to represent the data as a function of some of your hyperparameters and the statistical properties of the data. So you can see it's sort of at each iteration, it's kind of moving the data around, trying to find um, a way to represent it in uh, this three-dimensional space. So let's let it iterate a little bit more. You can already see some, some clusters, different clusters of the data kind of emerging. And notice that down here, I can sort of stop, I can pause it, perturb it, I can change things like uh, the perplexity of the model. Um, I can change, you know, the learning rate. I can, you can even add, um, you can even sort of cast this from 3D into a 2D representation by clicking, by clicking the button here. And, and you can sort of see it in two dimensions now as well. Okay. So I, I bring this up because if you sort of want to come up with a way of visualizing some of your information, I find this to be a nice way to do it. I also like doing it for data exploration when I'm dealing with word vectors. So I can again come here and type type the word cat like we did for the PCA representation and I can find, find where cat is in this space. Okay, great. So that's TensorBoard. Um, and once again, the way I generated from my word embeddings that were generated through word to vec I generated the, um, the tensor data and the metadata was just by running this code block and, and feeding in, you know, uh, the model index to, to generate this, this information. So I wanted to make you aware of that in case you want to use it for some of your own work. Okay, now in all these above examples, we trained a word to vec model for the Rotten Tomatoes movie review data set. But for some applications, you might want to use embeddings that are gener generated on much larger data sets. For example, Wikipedia or Google News or some other data set. And you might want to use, because those are much bigger, you might trust those embeddings more and you might want to use them to represent the words in your corpus as a vector instead of what you train on the data set directly. Okay, now oftentimes you can just download embeddings directly from the web that are generated by other people and because they're just matrices, lookup tables effectively that tell you the vector representations of each of the unique words, you can use them to embed the words in your text instead of training a word to vec model formally. So I've downloaded one such pre-trained embedding. Uh, it's a popular one called Glove. And I've chosen these only because they're, they're pretty small among the pre-trained word embeddings online. I didn't want to take it super, I didn't want it to take super long for you to pull the code from our courses GitLab repository onto your, your local desktop. So I chose a small one. It has a 50 dimensional representation and it's it's stored here in materials data glove 6b50d.txt. So each line of the file is a word. It's followed by 50 numbers and those constitute the embeddings of that word. So I can, I've written this helpful function here that will import it for you called load glove model. And you can import all 400,000 words that are in the glove model and their vector representations so that for a given word that you might be interested in, let's say the word fish, you can get the 50 dimensional representation. Okay, so for the first learning exercise um, of the homework, I'm going to ask you to describe a circumstance where the use of pre-trained word embeddings would not be appropriate for representing words in a given text, and I'd like you to explain why. The second question here is gonna deal with comparing word embeddings. So I'm gonna ask you to assume that we have a set of embeddings generated from a variety of corpora, and we're interested in understanding how similar or different these embeddings are. And I'd like you to propose a method to compare two embeddings generated by word to vec trained on two separate corpora, and implement your method in code to compare the embeddings generated by the Rotten Tomatoes data set against the pre-trained glove model embeddings. Any method that you do here is fine. Um, it doesn't need to be the most computationally effective method. It doesn't need to be uh, the highest performing method, any of that. I just, I wanna see that you can sort of rationally think through 
how you solve this problem and justify your choices here, okay? It's totally fine to borrow from the literature or things that you see online if you, insofar as you understand um, the method that you're using to compare those embeddings, okay? The third thing I'm gonna ask you to do is to um, think about how to account for multiple word senses when you're using word to vec So more specifically, when we were in the lectures, uh, we discussed how words can have more than one sense, right? Apple, for instance, could refer to a technology company and it could refer to a fruit depending on the context that it appears in. So for example, if we're um, speaking about technology, Apple's probably referring to a company, okay? And if we're speaking about orchards, you know, Apple's probably referring to a fruit. Now, what I'd like you to do is propose a method. You don't have to write any code. Just propose a method that you could use to address this problem. So effectively, I want you to think about how word to vec is implemented, the mechanics of it, and either tell me how you could update word to vec to account for this context uh, so that you could, you know, kind of find a, a contextual embedding for the word uh, apple, where the context here, by the way, refers to, is it a company or is it a, an orchard? Um, or you can kind of lay out a clever pre-processing approach, for instance, that you could use to address this problem and use standard word to vec okay? Either of those is fine. Okay, so now let's head to the second part of the tutorial. This one's about doc to vec Now recall that an embedding is just another way of representing our text, right? Um, it takes each of the words, turns it into a vector. In the case of word to vec we're trying to learn an embedding that allowed us to relate the one-hot representations of a given word to the one-hot representations of the context words. And because of this, word to vec provides a single vector representation for each distinct word in the vocabulary. This is useful, of course, if we want to discover similar words based on their contextual usage or to compare corpora based on their uh, uh, embeddings or their... Um, but Word level vector representations may not be the best way to represent text in all circumstances. That was sort of one of the impetus of this lecture, right? We wanted to think about text as a sequence. And, you know, we want to get beyond just thinking about individual word embeddings, but find a way to, to comprehensively look across many word embeddings to, uh, to have vectors that we can use to make more meaningful predictions about outcomes we care about, like for instance, the Rotten Tomatoes movie review uh, or some other problem that you might care about. Okay, so one super simple way to handle this is with an approach called doc to vec doc to vec is a simple modification of word to vec that's proposed by the same author of the word to vec algorithm, Mikhailov, and it creates a fixed length numerical representation of a document regardless of the document's length. So what that means is if the document has 10,000 words, it's going to create a vector that's, let's say, 100 long to represent it. If the document has three words, it's going to, again, create a vector that's 100 long to represent it, right? So it, it's, it always creates a single vector representation per document. Now, you can read Mikhailov's full paper for the technical details of how this is done. Okay, but effectively, the way that he's doing it is he puts in, for each of the documents, an additional vector that specifies um, which document the, uh, the word came from. And then he can use the matrix that uh, is sort of tying the weights between the document vector and the word vectors to identify for each document the, uh, the representation. Okay, so Let's come here and talk about data for the tutorial. We're once again gonna use the Rotten Tomatoes data set. This is just the same thing we did in the, from the previous portion of the tutorial. Training doc to vec is very similar to training word to vec because we're using the same GenSim model. So there's only one catch here, which is you have to, you have to be careful about you know, formatting it precisely the way they want it or it won't generate the document representations for you. I've just shown you an example of how to do it here. Okay, and um, then you can train your doc to vec the same way you would have trained the word to vec. Once again, note that there are several hyperparameters that exist when you're training doc to vec. Um, and obviously, the way that you set these hyperparameters will impact the performance of the model. 
Okay, here's an illustration of DocTivec working. I can take one document that I've generated, the rock rocks, I can put it into DocTivec, and I can print out the vector. I can take a slightly longer document, and so he went a very, very long way. I can also print out that vector, and you can see that um, it may not be obvious just by eyeballing it, but these two vectors are actually the same length. Okay, so again, the point of this is I can take documents of different lengths and come up with a same length representation for them. Okay, so the homework for learning, or the second homework component is going to be using DocTivec features for Rotten Tomatoes movie classification. So you're going to extract your DocTivec features. You're going to train logistic regression model using sklearn on an 80-20 split and report the AURC. Okay, the second thing I'm going to ask you to do is create document vectors from the raw word vector. So these are, I'm going to ask you to basically propose an approach to create document vectors, just assuming you had a set of word vectors and any approach is fine insofar as once again you can justify your approach. Okay and the next thing I'm going to ask you to do is compare embeddings through visualizations. Okay so more specifically I'd like you to take the best performing doc to vec embedding from part A and uh, the vectors you generated from part B generate a two-dimensional representation using either PACA or TSNE and and compare the two. Okay, so the next thing that we're going to be talking about is batching. Okay, and let me start off by saying that for everything that we've done in this course up till now, we've had a pretty standard procedure, right? We've always loaded our text data into memory, we've formatted the text data. Uh, to a set of tokenized sentences. We've formatted the labels we wanted to predict, for example, positive and negative for the movie reviews. We then generate a numerical representation of the text. We generate a numerical representation of the labels, and we train a model that maps the numerical representations of the text to a numerical representation of the labels. This procedure is going to be roughly the same no matter what kind of data we're working with or what kind of labels we want to predict. But one fatal flaw in our execution of this general procedure has ironically been our step zero, this loading our text data into memory, um, precisely because we've been loading the entire data set into memory all at once for everything, for tokenization, formatting, splitting, uh, into training and testing, modeling, etc. And we've been able to get away with this so far because our data sets have intentionally been on the smaller side. I know it might not feel that way when you are uh, hitting memory issues, but but these data sets have, are actually quite small by NLP standards. The Rotten Tomatoes movie review data set, for example, was only 10,000 reviews. Um, but if you're going to train models in the real world, it's not going to be practical or even possible to pull the entire data set into memory all at once in all circumstances. Uh, you may recall that you faced some painful memory errors in some of the earlier assignments, or at least some of you did. And keep in mind that that data was not even very large by NLP standards. So if you wanted to, for example, represent all of Wikipedia as a bag of words or train a model to predict poorly written Wikipedia articles, I mean, you'd start hitting memory problems real quick. Now, one solution to this is uh, obviously the tongue-in-cheek solution is to quit grad school and work for a company with supercomputers. But the better solution, I think, is to find a way to do your processing in manageable chunks or batches. So let's go through some practical examples of how you do batching with the lar a larger version of the Rotten Tomatoes movie review data set that I downloaded from the web. You can see that data here. And this version contains 480,000 reviews as opposed to the 10,000 reviews that were in the smaller set. Okay, So it's at a point where doing any kind of major processing with it all at once in memory could cause problems, is the thought. Okay, so. Instead of processing it all at once, let's open the data file and read in only the first three lines, each time placing and replacing what we see in the variable line so that we don't abuse the poor computer's memory. Okay, that's what, so what I'm doing here is I'm pointing to the file I want to open, I'm opening it, reading the first line, reading in the second line, replacing uh, uh, the variable within line so that I don't kind of eat up unnecessary memory, and, and again doing this for the third line. Okay, you can see here that 
The first line contains the header of the CSV file, freshness and review, and then the second line contains um, the text and the freshness score. One here is, is a good score and zero is a bad score. Okay, well, if we want to parse this file one at a time, we're going to probably want to split it on the comma character, right? So this one here. The problem is that this comma character doesn't just show up here. It shows up all over the, the text, right? So if we try to split this on comma, we're going to end up breaking this review too, okay? This is one of the reasons why um, a lot of tools, for example, PyTorch, want you to store your data in something called JSON lines format, which basically is a JSON file without, or a list of um, JSON objects, but without the opening and closing square brackets at the beginning and the end, okay? It has some nice advantages. For instance, it's not sensitive to uh, having to split things up on commas because you're, you just index them by uh, the name in each of the rows, okay? So we're gonna try to store some things in JSON lines format. And because we're interested in batching, why don't we start our first uh, kind of voyage into that domain by writing a function that's going to, in batch sizes of, let's say, 100,000 lines at a time, convert the CSV into a JSON format or JSON lines format. I've, uh, I've included the function that does that here. You can actually access this in utils.py by navigating here to code and just opening up utils.py right here. And you can see all the code um, for the helper functions I'm gonna be covering mostly in this, this batching part of the tutorial. Okay, effectively though, all this does is it takes a source file, it takes a destination file. So the source file is, is the raw CSV, the destination file is the JSON line style uh, file that I wanna store this in. And then it says, tell me how many lines at a time you wanna read in. And uh, ver this verbose flag says, do you want me to print out every time I've completed a batch? And you can run this and you see it will sort of step through each time processing and it will dump um, its processing of the raw CSV, the results into this uh, JSON lines style format, okay? I encourage you to open up this utils.py and take a look at practically how I end up uh, doing the batching. I thought it would be a little bit too much time to do it all in the tutorial. So I, I abstracted it away to the utilities here for you to look at on your own time. Okay, this file though had 480,001 rows of data because there was a header and then 480,000 uh, rows. So obviously it took four batch or five batches here. Okay, well now that we have the data in JSON lines format, um, we're going to need to use it for modeling, right? And we probably for our modeling purpose, you know, we don't wanna import everything all at once. Um, for instance, if we're training a neural network, we could just update the parameters using a subset of the data, right? Because um, neural networks effectively have a non-convex optimization surface anyway. So if we take small subsets of the data, as long as those subsets kind of point us in a, generally the right direction when we're performing our stochastic gradient descent, for instance, we'll still end up converging to the setting of the parameters that should be optimal. Okay, so if we're gonna train our model using batches, we're gonna need a function that will pull only the batch that we're interested in into memory so we can leave the rest of the data on the disk until we need it. So to help with this, I've written a, a function that gets a batch from a JSONal uh, data structure. And you can find the code for that again in utils. I'm just gonna use this function by way of demonstration to extract batch number 89, assuming a batch size of five. So what this does is it says, basically I wanna return you know, five rows of that JSON line style object, which you can see is down here now. Okay, and it wants the 89th batch. So that's basically, uh, you know, the five times 89 kind of indexed into that file and then grabbing the next five. Okay, that's basically what this get batch function does.
Now, obviously, uh, we received five rows. Uh, we don't have to just limit ourselves to five. We could, for example, get 100,000 at a time if we thought our memory could handle it. And this is just showing you an example of getting the first 100,000 uh, rows and getting the last 100,000 rows. And I, I wanted to show you this because I've included in this function get batch um, something called an end flag, which basically says, is this the last batch in the data set? Which obviously if um, you only have 480,000 lines and you're grabbing this 100,000 lines at a time, by the time you get to the fifth batch, you've, you don't have 100,000 lines left. You only have 80,000 left. So that's how you know that this is the final batch, right? And it can return that flag so that if you're going to be doing batch processing, you could, for example, stop when this final uh, batch flag is equal to true. Okay, now the last thing that we're going to need from a batch processing perspective is some sort of a function that can split our data, again, without loading it all into memory, into a training, a validation, and a testing set, right? That's what we always need when we want to do machine learning. Okay, so I've written a function to help you with that here. This function split file takes in, obviously, the file you want to split, which is the, um, the JSON lines uh, version of our Rotten Tomatoes review. And then it takes this... Um, dictionary where you specify a, uh, a name of the split and the percentage of the data you want to split here. You can call this whatever you want. You don't have to call it train. Um, but I chose to call it train validation and test. And you can see that I put the percentages that I wanted to split with here, 60, 20, and 20. Okay. And here, similarly, I chose how much data I want to load in at a time into my memory. There's some practical trade-offs here, right? If I load more data into my memory at a time, the code will probably run faster, but it will be more memory intensive. So if I made this number super small, and you can test this on your own if you'd like, you'll see that the code will run very, very slow, um, but will be you know, not memory intensive at all. So there's these trade-offs, but you can sort of use a function like this to help you handle that. Okay, again, just want to emphasize that this split file function does not require you to use train test validation. You see, I can I can split it sort of any way I want. Okay, and you're welcome to look at the code if you'd like to understand how you do some of this batching. Um, I think it will be useful for you, not just hopefully in the context of this class, but for other projects that you do where you're dealing with with larger data sets. Okay, the third problem I want you to solve in the homework has to do with generating vocabulary in batches. So in this fourth part of the tutorial, we're going to be discussing recurrent neural networks. And remember that the problem with Doc2Vec is that it completely ignores the order of the words in the text when computing the document representations. That is, it's not really a sequence model like we had discussed in the lectures. But of course, the sequential order in which words appear have an important consequence for the combined meaning. For example, if we're interested in classifying a movie review with the tokens well done, not and bad, it's not just the tokens, but also the order of the tokens that's indicative of the class label. Now we need a way to account for the sequential order of words when we're performing our modeling, and this is where recurrent neural networks can come into play. As we discussed in the lectures, RNNs and their derivatives provide a way to account for the sequential relationships between words by retaining some information about the previous elements in the sequence when considering a given element. Please note that here in this tutorial, we're going to be mainly covering the practical elements of how you build an RNN style network in PyTorch. If you're interested in learning how to build an RNN from scratch, there's an excellent publicly available tutorial that's right here, available in this hyperlink. And before we jump into a discussion about RNNs, I'd like to discuss activation functions. So recall that the motivating purpose of the sigmoid activation function was to squeeze the values of our linear function within a range of interest, for instance, 0 to 1. The sigmoid accomplished this nicely, but there's nothing that requires us to use the sigmoid um, if we want to restrict our output to a numerical range of, of interest. We could, for example, rectify our function's output value anytime it's out of range instead. Let's say we had a function f of x, we want to bound in the range 0 to 1. We could just say, hey, anytime this function is above 1, I'm going to set it to 1. And anytime it's below 0, I'm going to set it to 0. And if x was generated by, for example, a linear function, 
then we would call f of x a rectified linear unit, or ReLU. Now, both the ReLU and the sigmoid have outputs that are non-negative. They're bounded between 0 and 1. This is fine when you're modeling probabilities, but there could be circumstances, for example, like we saw in the LSTM from the lecture, where we want our function to provide both positive and negative numbers. For instance, num uh, values between minus 1 and 1. And this is accomplished using the tan h function, or by shifting and scaling a sigmoid or ReLU. You can do it that way too, but tan h is uh, the preferred way among the neural net community. So in the context of neural networks, the sigmoid, the ReLU, and the tan h are all called activation functions. And I've coded up each of these from scratch here just to help solidify your intuition. Here's linear, uh, the linear function. You can see that the sigmoid is, you know, I kind of take my linear function, I kind of I can pipe any, it doesn't have to be from this linear function, it could be from any function, pipe it through the sigmoid. Um, the same goes for the ReLU and the tan h. And I've just plotted them here. You can see the tan h goes again from 1 to minus 1. Uh, the ReLU is just a linear function that's been sort of clipped um, at the, the range of interest, and the sigmoid is similar. Okay, these are among some of the most common activation functions that exist when we're speaking about neural networks, but there are other activation functions too. You can learn more about their pros and cons by following this link here and, and reading about the different kinds of activation functions that exist and what they're used for. Okay, so let's come to the first step of building an LSTM in PyTorch. An LSTM again is a kind of recurrent neural network, the long short-term memory recurrent neural network that basically has the advantage that it learns how to forget things that are irrelevant from a contextual perspective. Now, in my personal opinion, um, the trickiest part of using PyTorch is learning how to format your data before passing it into the models. So in the case of RNNs, there are some special formatting considerations that result from the fact that our sequences are going to be of multiple lengths, but we need to be able to classify them despite the multiplicity of lengths. And so let's, let's look through one very simple example of how you do this end-to-end, -end, starting with formatting our vocabulary. So to begin, let's import the vocabulary we generated when batch processing the larger Rotten Tomatoes data set from part three, again using a helper function that I've written here. Okay, this just... Um, puts the vocabulary in alphabetical order and adds two new special words, pad and missing, that I'm going to use to denote padding and missing words respectively. More specifically, the missing token is going to replace any tokens in our text that don't show up in the vocabulary. So if we had some nonsense word that didn't show up, it'll get replaced with missing. And then the pad token here is going to be app appended to the end of shorter sentences in our data set. So for instance, Let's say we have a sentence that just is pretty good. It says for the movie review, just two tokens, pretty good. But the longest sentence in our text was that movie was awesome. So it's uh, five tokens. Well, one thing we could do then is pad pretty good with three of these pad characters so that it's kind of technically the same length as the longest sequence, okay? That's what this padding is gonna be used for. So note that this uh, helper function that I wrote up here also allows us to sort of clean out uh, elements of the vocabulary based on frequency. So this basically says remove any words that occur less than 25 times. That removes about 80% of the words, leaving us with about 20,000 for us to deal with. Okay, the second step is to do something called one-hot coding. We, did, we covered what one-hot coding was when we first spoke about word to vec in lecture four. Um, but to build a model, remember that you need a way of representing the text numerically. Okay, and it, when you're doing sentence level processing, bag of words is the way to do that. When you're doing word level processing, one-hot coding is the way to do that. Let's go through an example with some very simple data. Let's say I have these three sentences. And um, obviously, you usually start any kind of processing by tokenizing the text, right? So I'm going to take these three sentences, and I'm going to write 
some code so that I can turn them into these three sentences. Okay, they're just tokenized versions of the original. And I can one hot encode these sentences, which in our case is basically just representing them as their index in the vocabulary. Okay, and I've written a helper function for that right here. Okay, you can also look this uh, helper function up in our utils folder. Now notice that each token um, here matches uh, the index of that token in the vocabulary. So 17308, for instance, is the index of the in our vocabulary. And so uh, 18830 is the index of was and so on and so forth. Notice here that this uh, nonsensical token here got replaced with a one, and that's because it's basically representing the, the missing token catch-all for anything that didn't show up in the vocabulary. And remember, that was by design. Okay, the third step is to perform padding and tensor preparation. So well, as we discussed in the Doctivec portion of the tutorial, most models expect a fixed length input tensor. But in their current state, each of our simple sentences are different lengths because each has a different number of words. Now, one way to handle this is to pad the shorter sentences with the pad token until all the sequences are the same length. And um, recall that this prepare vocabulary helper function had a special token pad for this purpose and that its index was assigned to position zero. So because the index was zero and our one hot is uh, converting things to their index representation, I can just zero pad in order to indicate um, these, these padding values, okay? So you can see that if I run my code block up here now, I turn this uh, object here, which everything was a different length, into this zero padded object where everything is, is the same length in the tensor now. And now that all of our tensors, or sentences rather, are the same length, um, there's only one step left, which is to basically transpose this uh, for no other reason that PyTorch expects it in this format transposed instead of this format. So I've just transposed the vector and, or the tensor and represented it like this. Okay, well, remember last time we were speaking all about batching um, it'd be very nice if we were going to be working with a very large data set and doing analysis of our neural networks or training of our neural networks in batches that we could grab batches of tensor data directly from the disk and use those batches, flush them before we go grab the next one. What I've done here with this get tensor batch function is call the get batch that we discussed in part three of the tutorial. And I basically, you know, get some data and an end flag. And I follow some of the steps from above to convert this into a tensor uh, representation. So I'll just show you a demo of it right here. I, I have this get tensor batch function. I pass in the data path, which is JSON line style format uh, file. I indicate the batch number, in this case, batch number one how many uh, data points I want, which is three, and this max sequence length, which says basically how long should the tensors, how long is the longest tensor in the, uh, in the data. And this will then generate, as you can see, three columns of data, and they're each 38 long. Uh, it also generates, obviously, the output target label that we can use for training. So. Basically, the point of this is I call this point to my data and I get the training data X and the outcome Y that represents what I need for training a model. Okay, the next step now that we can collect data from the disk in batches is to load some pre-trained embeddings. So these one hot coded vectors are actually technically not vectors yet, right? They're indices to vectors. And so we'll need to convert them into proper vectors 
Um, and, but instead of training those vectors from scratch, it's usually useful to start with some pre-trained embeddings. Um, we had used GenSim uh, earlier, and we had shown that you could train a word to vec embedding. But here, let's actually, going back to that first part of the tutorial, let's instead load in the glove embeddings and work with those. So this helper function here, load embeddings, basically takes a path to the um, embeddings that I'm interested in using. It takes a vocabulary object so that the vocabulary or the embeddings can be ordered in the same uh, indices as the vocabulary object. And you, you tell it what the embedding dimension is and it will return the embeddings to you, okay? You can then obviously use these embeddings very simply. They're, they happen to all be nice and neat in tensor format so that they can be used in PyTorch. You take these embeddings and you can use them to, for example, identify um, the representation of Apple or some other word that you might care about. Okay, now that we're done with the hard part, let's go to what I think is the easier part, which is the model specification. Here I have specified an RNN in Torch, specifically it's an LSTM, and I've included ample comments within this function in an effort to explain the logic for it. If you did work with PyTorch in a feedforward neural network, there's actually no real difference here. It's just that the layers are slightly different, right? Once again, here in the init, I'm defining uh, the different kinds of layers I have, and then in forward, I'm kind of defining how I combine those layers computationally to generate my outputs here. Okay, so you can read through this code, modify it if you'd like, use it as a starting point for your own work as you wish. Now that the model specified, obviously, just like we did last time, we have to choose some hyperparameters. Okay, number of hidden nodes, number of output nodes, number of layers, do we want it to be bidirectional or not? Do we want to add dropout? I mean, there's a bunch of features that we can sort of, or hyperparameters that we can choose. We instantiate our model just like we did in the previous homework. We choose the optimizer, we set the loss. And here, for those of you who were curious about GPUs and emailed me, I've included how you uh, optionally push to GPU if it's available. Okay, now one thing I like to do after I've completed this is I always print my model by just calling print on the model. And you can see that as long as these sort of numbers all make sense to you, the dimensionalities make sense, then your model is usually ready for training. This says take a 19,495 dimensional vector. These are those one hot coded vectors, right? The indices, uh, so to speak, or what the indices represented. Convert this to a 50 dimensional representation, which are the glove embeddings take those 50 dimensional representations and put them through the LSTM to generate a 32 dimensional representation. Take those 32 dimensional representation and map it to a uh, one dimensional representation which gets passed through the sigmoid for conversion to a probability, okay? So you can sort of see how these numbers all kind of make sense. Um, the ending number from each of these states kind of maps to the next one. Another thing that I like to do to give me an idea of how likely I am to find the optimal setting of all the parameters is to check the number of parameters. So here I can print out the total number of trainable parameters. You can see it's very close to a million. What this tells me is, is not that it's impossible for me to train the network or anything, but just that you know, I might need some computational power to do it. I might need several machines. Those machines might need to train with this uh, data set for uh, days, maybe weeks, who knows. But the thing to basically keep in mind here is the larger this number of trainable parameters, the larger space you have to search. And so the more sensitive your model is going to be to things like initialization of uh, weights and things like that. Okay, so the final check that you should always do when you specify any model in Torch, whether it's an RNN, uh, uh, an LSTM, convolutional neural net, feed forward uh, neural net is once you've specified it, 
you always want to kind of test it on the data that you generated. So here, look, I'm generating a batch of data using that function that we wrote a little earlier. So I've got the x, x lengths, y, and n flag. I'm feeding those into the model to generate predictions, and I'm going to print those predictions. And remember, I had set the batch size to 3. And look, I got three numbers out. So this sort of tells me just without having done any training of the model that I did this correctly, right? Because I put in my inputs and I got my, my outputs with the same dimensionality I was expecting with no errors. Okay. Now what you're going to help me with in this homework is training the network in batches. So more specifically, you're going to write a function, train, and it's going to train the uh, classifier that we specified above in the tutorial, the LSTM, to um, basically do what we did in homework three, but just do it in batches. So remember how we had a for loop where we were training um, over multiple epochs? Within each of those for loops, you're going to want to have another for loop that takes care of multiple batches. Okay, that's effectively the difference between this and the previous one. Okay. I want to note here, your personal machine is likely to struggle to find optimal parameters because there's almost a million of them. Don't worry if you can't get it. I just want to see that you can uh, build the loop to train these kinds of models um, and that you can show me the loss decreasing on the training and the validation set. As long as you can do that for some number of batches, then that's acceptable for the purposes of the homework. So in this last part of the tutorial, we're going to be discussing parts of speech tagging. And unlike what we did in the lecture, we're not going to be training a model to generate parts of speech, verbs, uh, uh, nouns, adjectives, etc. Instead, we're going to be learning how to use a pre-existing tool called Spacey to do some of the parts of speech tagging for us. Okay. I strongly encourage you to experiment with Spacey on your own. If you're going to be doing um, tasks in NLP, it has a lot of useful tools, just like Hugging Face did. And remember, the purpose of this tutorial is not only to build some of your uh, practical intuitions for these methodologies, but I want you to gain familiarity with some of the pre-existing tools so that you can contribute to the state of the art more effectively. So that's a long-winded way of me saying, I encourage you to experiment with Spacey on your own, but for the purposes of the tutorial, I've written just a very simple wrapper for it. Um, I've shown you how you import my wrapper code and you execute it here. And all it does is it generates a, a pandas data frame that contains each of the tokens, um, which sentence they're in, and then it, cr it, it creates several features on top of um, these tokens, which you can, you can include these features, for example, in your own sequence-to-sequence -sequence RNN model, right, as we had discussed. Remember, we spoke about capitalization, for example, as, as a feature that you could include to uh, improve your own parts of speech tagger. Well, I've, ex I've extracted some features here that might be useful if you were going to be doing something like that. Okay, so the parts of speech tag specifically is here in this column. You can see pronoun, verb, uh, uh, number, noun, and so on. Uh, these particular parts of speech tags may not be obvious exactly what they are. If you dig through the documentation of Spacey, you can find them. But uh, I've also sort of pasted them here for you in case you'd like to just not navigate away from the tutorial. ADJ is adjective. ADP is add position and so on. Okay, now for the last part of our homework, what I'd like you to do is take the word to vec implementation, which is done in PyTorch below, and I want you to modify it so that the word to vec includes a one hot coded vector that includes or encodes the parts of speech of the target word. Okay, and then I want you to train the implementation with and without your modification and comment on how you expect the characteristics of the embedding to change when you add that information to the model. Even if you can't get this to work, which should be a 
a relatively straightforward modification to add a additional vector to this model so that you can encode the parts of speech tag. But if for whatever reason you're not able to get it to work, please at least comment on how you expect the characteristics of the embeddings to change when adding this information to the model.